Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at the householder triangularization method to compute the QR decomposition of a matrix. The householder method works by taking a matrix and applying a sequence of reflection matrices to it that convert it into upper triangular form, from which we can derive our QR factorization. The Householder algorithm that we're going to look at is named after Alston Householder, an American numerical analyst who lived from 1904 to 1993. And the Householder algorithm is actually more numerically stable and efficient than the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process. However, Gram-Schmidt has the additional benefit that we can build up our QR decomposition in terms of looking at the spaces spanned by successive columns of A. And this is sometimes useful, and in the householder method, we'll have to forego having this additional mathematical structure. Let's look at a matrix A of size m by n, and in the householder method, we're going to take a different approach of applying a sequence of matrices Q, K, that are orthogonal to this matrix A to convert it into upper triangular form. So specifically, we'll have this product Qn times Qn minus 1 up to Q1, apply to A, and that will give us our upper triangular matrix R. And from here, we can get the full QR factorization, A is equal to QR, where now Q is given in terms of Q1 transpose times Q2 transpose up to QN transpose. And in 1958, Householder proposed a way to choose the QK to introduce zeros below the diagonal in column K while preserving the previous zeros and it would look like the matrices that are shown here. We start with our matrix A that potentially has non-zero entries everywhere and we'd apply Q1 to our matrix and that would remove the non-zero entries below the diagonal in the first column. We then apply Q2 that would remove the non-zero entries in the second column below the diagonal and so on. And We'll actually see here that this is very similar to how the LU factorization worked, where we would apply the sequence of operators to remove the non-zero entries below the diagonal. However, here it's slightly different because we're now specifically requiring that those matrices we apply are orthogonal matrices. And we'll actually construct matrices that we refer to as householder reflectors in order to do this. So we'll choose our QK to be a block diagonal form and in the top left block we'll have the identity matrix of size K minus 1 times K minus 1 and in the bottom right block we'll have a matrix F that is of size M minus K plus 1 times M minus K plus 1 and that is a householder reflector and the first block, the I block ensures that the first k minus 1 rows are unchanged and our matrix F here will be an orthogonal matrix that operates on the bottom m minus k plus 1 rows and here F will be orthogonal and therefore we know that QK will be orthogonal. So what do we want our orthogonal matrix F to do here? So let X be a vector that denotes the entries from k to m in the kth column of our matrix. So we have two requirements for f. Firstly, we require that f is orthogonal, so we must have that the Euclidean norm of fx would be equal to the Euclidean norm of x. And in addition, we want that only the first entry of fx should be non-zero. So we could write this out in matrix form and we would have therefore our x vector that is potentially all non-zero entries and we then multiply it by f and we get a vector that is zero in entries from 2 to the end and is non-zero in its first entry and is of size equal to the Euclidean norm of x. So the question is how can we achieve this? We can think about this geometrically. If we start with our vector x, we want to map it to the vector fx 
that lies on the coordinate axis in the first dimension. And we could think about that in terms of this diagram that's shown here. We want to reflect our point x across a subspace h that's given by this diagonal line. And h will be the subspace that's orthogonal to the vector v that we define in terms of the Euclidean norm of x times e1 minus x. And the key point here is that h subspace bisects the vector v. We can see that this bisection property is because x and fx both live on the hypersphere centered at the origin with radius equal to the Euclidean norm of x. So next we need to determine the matrix F that maps our vector x onto Euclidean norm of x times e1. And F will be closely related to an orthogonal projection of x onto the subspace H since that projection takes us halfway from x to Euclidean norm of x times e1. And hence we'll first consider a orthogonal projection onto h and subsequently we'll derive f. So if we look at the orthogonal projection of a vector a onto b that will be given just in terms of a dotted with b divided by the norm of b squared times b. And therefore the matrix V times V transpose divided by V transpose V orthogonally projects X onto V. Now let's introduce the projection operator P subscript H that's equal to I minus V V transpose divided by V transpose V. And it follows that P H applied to X will be the orthogonal projection of X onto H and therefore it satisfies that pH of x is contained within the subspace h. And we can verify that by looking at v transpose applied to pH of x, and that will be equal to v transpose x minus v transpose applied to v v transpose over v transpose v times x. And we'll notice here that we have a common factor here of v transpose v that will cancel away, and we'll therefore end up with v transpose x minus v transpose x and that will be equal to zero. And that therefore tells us that pH of x has to be within this subspace. In addition, the projection error, x minus pH of x, is orthogonal to h. And if we look at x minus pH of x, we can write that in terms of x minus x plus vv transpose over v transpose v, x, and that will just be equal to this final term here, v v transpose over v transpose v applied to x and that will be parallel to v. However recall that our matrix F that is going to be part of our household reflector has to reflect across the subspace H rather than project onto H and therefore we can obtain F by going twice as far in the direction of v compared to pH so that we have here now that F is equal to i minus 2 v v transpose over v transpose v. And we'll now just do a small calculation to verify that f constructed in this way will be an orthogonal matrix. When we do householder triangularization we make use of the matrix f that's defined as i minus 2 v v transpose over v transpose v where v is a vector and this f represents a linear transformation that is a reflection in the plane normal to V. And we'll now verify that this matrix F is orthogonal. And to do this, we will look at F transpose F, and that will be equal to I minus two V V transpose, all transpose, over V transpose V, multiplied by I times 2 V V transpose over V transpose V. And since this denominator is a scalar, it's unaffected when we take this transpose operation. 
And if we now look at VV transpose of transpose, then we can write that as I minus two V transpose transpose V transpose over V transpose V. And we'll note here that V transpose transpose is just equal to the vector V. And we actually therefore get back the same expression that we had before. And we therefore have I minus two V V transpose over V transpose V times I minus two V V transpose over V transpose V. And if we now multiply these terms out, we'll get I minus four V V transpose over V transpose V. We'll get two copies that come from multiplying this term by the identity and this identity by this term. And then we'll get the cross term. And that will give us four times V V transpose V V transpose over V transpose V all squared. But we'll know here that we've got a factor of V transpose V on the top and a factor of V transpose V on the bottom, and they will therefore cancel away. And we therefore have the same term here for, for V V transpose over V transpose V, and we have a negative and positive copy, and therefore we'll just be left with the identity. And that therefore verifies that this matrix is orthogonal. And we could also verify that this is equal to F, F transpose. We now have a way to construct our orthogonal matrix F, and therefore our matrix QK, but there is a subtlety that we're first going to address. And it's worth noting that when we construct our household reflector, we actually have two points that we could choose from. In addition to projecting to the Euclidean norm of X times E1, we could equally well project to minus the Euclidean norm of x times e1. That will also satisfy all of the properties that we need. And in practice, it's important to choose the better of the two reflectors available. And if our vector x is very close to the Euclidean norm of x multiplied by e1, then we could obtain a loss of precision due to cancellation when we compute this vector v. So to ensure that x and its reflection are well separated, then we should choose the reflection to be equal to minus sine of x1, the first component of x, times the Euclidean norm of x multiplied by e1. And we'll look into more details of this on the next slide. So therefore, we want that our vector v should be equal to v is equal to minus the sine of x1 times the Euclidean norm of x multiplied by e1 minus x. But since the sine of v does not affect f, then we scale v by minus 1 to get that v is equal to sine of x1 multiplied by the Euclidean norm of x times e1 plus x. Let's compare the two options for the potentially problematic case when our vector x is approximately equal to plus or minus the Euclidean norm of x times e1. So in that case, the magnitude of x1 will be roughly equal to the Euclidean norm of x. So we can make two definitions here. We'll first look at the bad choice, which is opposite from the one that we introduced, where we have an additional minus sign. So this would give us our vector v bad that would be equal to minus the sign of x1 times the Euclidean norm of x times e1 plus x, and then we'll have v good, which is our usual definition, and that's equal to the sine of x1 times the Euclidean norm of x times e1 plus x. Now let's look at the Euclidean norm squared of v bad, and we can write this in two parts. If we look at the first component, then we'll have minus sine of x1 times the Euclidean norm of x plus x1, all squared, and then we'll have the Euclidean norm of all of the other components. And we can know here that x1 can be written as sine of x1 times the absolute value of x1. And if we do that, 
then we see that these terms in this first part of our norm expression are actually almost equal and will cancel away. In addition, the second term will also cancel away because most of our vector x is aligned in the direction of the first coordinate. And therefore, we'll get that this Euclidean norm squared roughly evaluates to zero. If we look at the Euclidean norm squared of the other vector, v good, then we don't get that cancellation because we have that additional minus sign flip. And therefore, this will evaluate to 2 times the sine of x1 times the Euclidean norm of x, all squared. Now recall that v is computed from two vectors with magnitude equal to the Euclidean norm of x. And the argument above shows that if we use v bad, then we can have that the Euclidean norm of v is significantly smaller than the Euclidean norm of x. And therefore, we could have a loss of precision due to cancellation in our method. In contrast, if we use v good, then we'll always have that the Euclidean norm of v good is greater than or equal to the Euclidean norm of x. And that rules out the possibility of loss of precision due to cancellation. We can now write out the householder algorithm. And we'll loop over the columns k from 1 to n. And we'll first compute our vector x, which is given by the kth column of our matrix A, from the diagonal and below. We'll use that x to compute our vector v, as in the previous slides, and we'll normalize that vector v. We'll then use this vector v to apply our householder reflector to our matrix A. And note that in this line of the algorithm, we don't have to divide by v transpose v because we've already normalized that vector. After we've run this algorithm, it will replace our matrix A with the upper triangular form R, and we're also storing all of those vectors v1 up to vn. The householder algorithm asymptotically will require 2 times m times n squared minus 2 thirds n cubed operations, and is therefore a little more efficient than the Gram-Schmidt method. Note, however, that we don't explicitly form the matrix Q in the algorithm. However, we can use the vectors v1 up to vn to compute the q in a post-processing step. And we recall here that our matrix qk is of this block diagonal form with the identity and then this matrix f of size m minus k plus 1. And q will be given in terms of qn multiply by qn minus 1 up to q1, all transpose and that's equal to q1 transpose times q2 transpose up to qn transpose. In addition, we'll note that the household reflectors by construction are actually all symmetric, and therefore we'll just have that q is equal to q1 times q2 up to qn. Hence, given a vector x, we can evaluate qx in terms of q1 applied to q2, applied to all the, all the other matrices up to qn, applied to x, using the vk. So we can have a small algorithm here for k equal 1 to n, where x from entries k to up to m is equal to x from k up to m minus 2 times vk times vk transpose applied to x. Now, from this definition, we can ask how can we actually compute our matrix q? And the answer is that we can compute q by evaluating the products q times the unit vector ei for i equal 1 to m. If we want to calculate the reduced qr factorization, then we can evaluate the matrix q hat by computing q times ei, but now restricting to i equal 1 to n instead. Note, however, that for many applications, we don't require either q or q hat. For example, suppose we're solving a linear system, ax equal b, then we can write that as q times r times x is equal to b, and we can therefore get that r times x is equal to q transpose b, and so the only thing that we require is to evaluate that matrix product q transpose b. 
and that will be equal to qn multiplied by qn minus 1 multiplied by all of the other q's up to q1 multiplied by b and we can use a small algorithm to evaluate that. We'll loop for k equal 1 to n and we'll evaluate the action of qk on b and since each matrix qk has an identity block in the first k minus 1 entries then it will only affect the remaining part of the b vector and that will improve the efficiency of the algorithm and cut down on the number of floating point operations that are required.